My name is Blake Moore, Natural Resources Extension Agent. Hey, I'm Dan Severson, Ag Agent. Hi, I'm Jake Jones, Kent County Ag Agent for the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension. Welcome to Extension 302. Welcome to Extension 302, where we are dropping knowledge, keeping Extension real, reliable, and relevant. I am Dan Severson, along with Dr. Jake Jones. Hi, everyone. And Mr. Blake Moore. He is I, and I am him. Ha! Today, we are going to talk to Dr. David Owens. Dr. Owens has been on our podcast before when we talked about cicadas. Dr. Owens, you are the entomologist for commercial ag crops. You're the insect specialist housed in Georgetown. And at every workshop I attend and listen to you, you always come up with like a bug joke or pun. I just totally enjoy it. And here in Extensive 302, we normally start with an icebreaker. But this time, I want you to ask us or give us a joke and see if we can figure it out. Okay. Well, why was the butterfly not invited to the dance? There you go, guys. Why was the butterfly not invited to the dance? All you wallflowers out there. Because it was a moth ball. <laughs> a moth ball. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. I love it. I was stumped. I was really sitting there thinking hard. I'm like, hmm, I know about butterflies. What, is it? what could it be? <laughs> That's awesome, man. Dr. Owens, what's your deal? What, born, raised, your school hobbies? What? What brought you here? Give us a little bit of history about you. First, thank you for having me today. So I've always been interested in bugs. And it wasn't until I got to college when I was like, I need a summer job that actually has to do with bugs. And I knew I didn't want to work for the Orkin Man or Terminex. But I didn't know what else they have there great was. Commercial. They do have great commercials. And who is it? Is it Paramount that has the great picture of a cockroach? On oh, the back? big cockroach. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. It creeps my wife out every time we, we go over the Bay Bridge. Okay. <laughs> anyway. So you're going another route. Yeah. So it turned out Virginia Tech had a research farm less than an hour from where I grew up. So I reached out to the ag entomologist there, who was Ames Herbert at the time, who worked with cotton, soybeans, and peanuts. And he was in the middle of putting together his summer work crew. How old were you? Uh, this was probably 19 or 20. And so that's that's how I got my start in ag entomology. And I loved it. I, I loved the interaction between the research and being outside and the farmers and having field days. It was a very good experience, very formative experience. So you matriculated as an entomologist. You just didn't know exactly what field you wanted to end up in. Is that kind of what I'm getting? Right. So once I started working for him, I knew extension ag entomology is where i wanted to stay awesome and so after after i've graduated from undergrad masters at virginia tech went to florida to work on sweet corn and then i bounced around a little bit before coming here working on avocados and then tomatoes and now i'm here in delaware working on a little bit of everything you see tomato i see potato they harvested some recently they're harvesting potatoes now today oh yeah yes Always an exciting day when, when money comes out of the field. There you go. UD extended at its best. And you're helping to make that money. One of the next question we have for you is what are you seeing out in the fields right now? What are you focused on? What should farmers be focused on to make sure that they get that money out of the ground? Right now, as I just mentioned, I've got field and vegetable crop responsibilities. So on the vegetable side, you've got a whole different suite of bugs that get into vegetables that don't get into field crops. But there are a few important insects that go after both. Right now, we're at the beginning of August uh, when we're recording this, and we're getting ready for our big major earworm flight. Corn earworm is probably the most significant field crop and vegetable crop pest late in the season. The second most would probably be stink bugs. And I've had a couple of calls on soybeans uh, from them recently. It's just a matter of any day now when our earworm trap counts will climb through the roof. So earworms get into soybeans, they get into sorghum, they get into tomatoes. Uh, sweet corn? They, they're the, sweet corn. they pass on sweet corn. I've got probably an acre's worth of sweet corn planted at Carvel right now, just waiting for the earworms to come in. Okay. It'll be silking in about two weeks. So we should hit it pretty spot on. And then behind that, I've got another planting, planted 10 days later. The month of September, we're going to be up to our eyeballs in 
wormy corn. You sound excited about that. I am. Oh, good. I am. Sweet uh, corn is sweet corn is probably the most fun crop to work with. You plant it, you fertilize it, and you walk away from it until it's time to spray it. You spray it five times and you're done. Tastes great too. I love it on my plate. So what kind of damage are you seeing from the earworms? So earworms will, will chew on all the reproductive structures of plants. So in soybeans, they carve out the pods. In tomatoes, they bore right through the fruit. In corn, they typically take out the tips. In hemp, they will destroy the buds. Uh, we've got about 20 acres or so of hemp this year, and they are the pest of hemp. Really? Yep. They go oh, yeah. just after the buds, not the leaves. Right. Yep. Then they will, they will make short work of the buds. Even um, regular cannabis? Yep. And I've also seen them in cabbage, in my fall cabbage, cabbage. plots. And they are disastrous in cabbage. Not too many, but when they do get in, they will take out a whole head. So David, you're telling us what we're seeing coming up. What were some of the major insect pests you saw previously this year? Let's go back to April, May timeframe. Probably our two biggest pests that we had were seed corn maggot. I heard reports of them damaging watermelons and cantaloupes in addition to soybeans and then slugs. I just love the way you guys name insects. It's, it's very creative. Like the corn earworm. What does it normally attack? <laughs> the ear of the corn? That's, it's, you know, that one's also got a couple of other common names. It's, got, it's called the tomato fruit worm, the soybean pod worm, the sorghum head worm, the cotton bowl worm, the tomato worm. And we can uh, rename uh, it the cannabis budworm now. It, the cannabis bud. <laughs> unfortunately, budworm has already been taken by the tobacco bud. Oh, okay. Well, you're on the right we'll track there, Blake. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but yes, we, we tried to stay very, very creative with our common names. So green stink bugs, you can guess what color they are. Uh, same with brown stink bugs. The tarnished plant bug just looks... Tarnished? Yeah. <laughs> it needs polish. Looks brown like with a little bit of yellow. It looks like Dan after a rough weekend or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, the, the, the bugs are fun. Yeah. So we have seed corn maggot was one of them. <laughs> seed corn <laughs> mustard and slugs. And slugs, yep, yeah. yep. And then um, yeah, every now and then aphids show up. It, again, it, it, it starts depending on the crop. For a couple of crops, they've got specific insects that come in at specific times. Alfalfa gets alfalfa weevil. And then it gets potato leaf hopper later in the summer. Tree fruit, right now, my peach trees at the house are ripening up, and probably three quarters of those peaches are infested with plum curculia, which came in early, and then it can't, had another flush come in the summertime. Oh, a what? It's a, it's a weevil about... It's called plum purpurio? Plum curculio. It's a small weevil about this big, um, maybe, a, maybe a quarter inch. Fifth of an inch, Centim five centimeters, a centimeter, third of a centimeter. Oh, geez. So we're going to like millimeters now. Half a centimeter. Yeah, something like that. It's a small insect, but they they lay their eggs in the fruit and the, the worms just turn the fruit into this rotting mass inside. Nasty, nasty critter. And then for small fruits, you get your own special pests. Here in Delaware, we have so many diverse types of crops and some of the insects are specialists and some of them are generalists and the specialists can really cause damage in specific times of the year. Answering the question, what was a problem early? Well, that, that depends on what crop you're talking about. But I'd say from the grand landscape scale, those two are probably the most problematic early. But it's good that you have these ideas of the dates and times that they show up because then you can start integrated pest management to help reduce the risk of an infection or something like that, correct? Yes. Some we can predict. Others we know about when they will show up and we start scouting fields. So some we can predict to within about a week and others we can predict to within a, you know, three weeks-ish based on experience. And so we start scouting fields and then we turn around and we put that information into the Friday weekly crop update. So that gets a lot of feedback from consultants, 
gets a lot of feedback from my scouting crew, fields that I've personally visited, fields that extension agents like like y'all have put me on to or have said, hey, so-and-so had a problem. That's a really good resource to have the weekly crop update. Is there other, any other spots that people can look at to kind of see those timelines of, hey, what's coming in, down the pipeline? Yeah, that's that's our primary one. This year, I've, I've started doing some pest patrol recordings. Uh, it's sponsored by Syngenta, in which if I see a major pest that's coming through, I'll record like a two-minute voicemail message. And then that program will text subscribers and you can subscribe to it for free. It's called Pest Patrol. That sounds awesome. And, and, and you can so you can select where you're at and what crops you want updates on. And so it'll text subscribers to that and you go to a small link and it'll just play the message. That's awesome. So it's kind of like the hotline that Joanne used to run back okay. in the day. Gotcha. And it's like McGruff the crime dog. You should get like a mascot. He is the mascot. What are you talking about? This is the legend right here. He is the legend. Okay, right now I'm seeing a lot of spotted lanternfly. What other insects do you see coming down the pike? You know, we're you know near the end of the season, like you said. We're, we're nearing the end of the season, but there's still a few very important late season pests to keep in mind. So on field crops, I mentioned corn earworm. That's the biggest one. Stink bugs are going to be moving. They're going to be moving out of some of their woodland hosts. They'll be concentrating in field crops, late soybeans. Mostly on the edges? Mostly, but not always. But they're going to start migrating into the middle now, right? Right. And they will also get into vegetables like tomatoes and snap beans. Grapes? Uh, grapes get their own little suite of pests. I'm not as familiar with the grape pests. No, but I think stink bugs like grapes. Stink bugs will get into grapes, and, and you don't want to crush them when you're making wine. But yeah. you have to crush them to make wine. you got to crush the grapes. You don't right. want to crush the bugs. Right. That'd be an interesting taste, probably, for that. Um, my kids always say they, uh, stink bugs, cilantro tastes like stink bugs. I'm like, how do you oh, taste interesting. It? Yeah, I'm like, how do you taste a stink bug? How do you know what a stink bug tastes like? <laughs> but yeah, they won't eat cilantro because it, they think it's a, it tastes like a stink bug. You know, it's funny you say that. I've got some blackberry plants at my house. And when I'm picking blackberries, I'll occasionally eat a few. And I can always tell which one had a stink bug on it because it has a very rancid, floral, semi-sweet, sour Tastes like crap. flavor. Yeah. So shouldn't it be called a taste bug instead of a stink bug? Uh, they've got smelly armpits. We need to send them some deodorant. Well, they have plenty of arms. How many arms do they have? They've got six arms. Yeah. See, yep. That's the problem. They need yeah. lots of deodorant. So you're talking mainly about the brown marmorated stink bug, right? Well, so we've got the brown marmorated, which is more concentrated up north. But then we also have some of our native stink bugs, the greens and the browns, primarily. A few others, but those are the, those are the biggies. And are they, because I've heard that there's some years that they're really bad and some years that they aren't. Is that something that happens here in Delaware? And is there any way that you guys can predict which year is going to be good and which year is going to be bad? Unfortunately, no, there's no good prediction for that. There's a lot of different factors that control their populations. A lot of beneficial insects that consume the eggs there. And then weather conditions, especially in the winter time. Uh, another pest that uh, we need to watch out for in the fall are aphids. Aphid populations start increasing. Anyone that's growing some late pumpkins for like Halloween, you need to pay attention to melon aphids and, and green peach aphids in there. They can, I've seen them build up to such glorious numbers that they, they pee out so much sticky sap from feeding on the plants that it coats the fruit and it'll turn that fruit black. And then no one wants to pick up a black pumpkin. Okay. So even though they're not doing a whole lot against that plant, unless they've got really high populations. Is that what they call frass? It's, it's both, it's, so to, yes, it's frass, but for aphids, we also call it honeydew. Aphids are big filter feeders. They consume sap and they filter all that sap out to get a little bit of protein and they pee the rest of that out. So they get what they want and the rest of their paycheck they just waste away. Yep. 
Yep. And and the spotted lanternfly does the same. And that's the really black you're it's, talking about is the sooty mold. Right? Yeah. And that's one of those things where it's not a public. Yeah, that's health what I concern. think it's more of a mold. It's 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 just unsightly, it's unmarketable. People don't people want the, the bright orange pumpkin for Halloween. They don't want one that's covered in sooty mold and honeydew. And and spotted lanternfly adults are emerging now and and they're going to start flying around in mass here pretty soon, laying eggs. And yeah, that's that's a nasty insect pest. Fortunately, it's in northern Delaware, and it's yeah, mostly but, kind of a uh, a homeowner ornamental pest. So I don't deal too much with it until it comes down enough to where we've got some of our vineyards. Right. Then I'll pay much more attention to it. But until then, I keep up with the news and some of the research that's going on with it. But I don't work with it yet. It's definitely on its way. I've heard of um, DDA has found populations. A little farther south than, than they'd like to so it's going to be a, a matter of time before it's down here but we're, they're doing a good job of slowing it down you know that's all we can really you touched on something i wanted to get a little bit more into was beneficial insects you mentioned that so you, you're talking about the dates and you know these guys are coming what is the best way to use beneficial insects is it better for a, like a high tunnel or can we use it out in a big field? And how do you promote the, the existence of those beneficial insects around the field? And how do we keep them? So those are all great questions, and they basically get to the heart of integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is a mindset to use multiple control tactics to prevent a pest outbreak. And then once you do have that outbreak, selecting a management tactic that is as least disruptive as possible and still give you a good bang for the buck. Sometimes that does involve pesticides. Mm -hmm. And there are some pests for which they are so damaging that you have to rely on an insecticide. But then for others, we can incorporate beneficials. So like aphids. Aphids are not, unless they're carrying viruses, they're not terribly damaging by themselves. So for some systems, we have a good idea of how many beneficials we have to see for how many aphids or even thrips before we need to be concerned about it. So a great example of that is wheat. Two years ago, we had a big aphid outbreak in wheat and some fields we were not finding natural enemies. And those aphid so, populations- So when you're scouting, you're also looking for beneficial insects as well. Yes. But Not then in other scouting. fields, we'd see, you know, three, 400 aphids on in a row foot, which is, you know, just a phenomenally high population. But we'd also see 15, 20 ladybugs okay. and parasitic wasps. And so we knew that, that we didn't have to do anything to that. That aphid population was going to crash. Keeping in mind some of the beneficials and the ratios between beneficials okay. and pests in some systems works out pretty well. In other systems there where it doesn't, we try to use the, the most selective insecticides and recommend the most selective insecticides to preserve those beneficials. For a lot of systems, we don't have that, that relationship of you've got one of these, so you can have five of those worked out. In those cases, we try to use the least disruptive materials that we can, so we keep some of the good guys around. And then there's also secondary pests that will flare up if we use a disruptive insecticide targeting a different pest. Because you're disrupting the whole ecosystem. You're disrupting the entire ecosystem. And there's a lot of things that can become a problem if we remove natural enemies. Because everything goes out of check. There's no checks and balances anymore. Right. And spider mites and aphids are classic secondary pest outbreak events that we sometimes create the problem. You mentioned high tunnels. High tunnels can give us a little bit of both. We can use beneficial insects in high tunnels, depending on the pest, much more easily than in an outdoor setting. But then high tunnels also kind of breed their own problems. Spider mites are much more problematic in a high tunnel. At the same time, it's easier to use a beneficial natural enemy in a high tunnel to target spider mites than it is in an, in an outdoor setting. All of the systems have their, their pros and cons, their trades and balances. And it's a very dynamic, agriculture is a very dynamic system. 
I'm glad you brought up integrated pest management because you know I think that helps with this common misconception that farmers just want to spray, spray, spray. And it, you know, it just goes to show that there's a lot of work being done so that, you know, you don't have to just do that. You can promote the beneficial insects. You can do cultural things while you're preparing your crops or harvesting them or what you're doing in the years before in order to make sure they're not as big a problem. And you guys are obviously a big part of that, doing the experiments and passing that down to the farmers and letting them know what they can do. So we appreciate that. And we wanted to know if you had any shout outs to anybody that you're working with or working for that you'd like to just thank or, you know, just talk about the working relationship with them? Well, you mentioned earlier, I, I am stationed in Georgetown. And in Georgetown, we've got a lot of our ag extension specialists. So we've got our plant pathologist position there, our weed scientists, our agronomists, our vegetable specialists. And it's just, it's a fantastic crew. Great people to work with down there at that facility. Our extension agents, y'all, Corey and Sussex, tremendously helpful and, and great people to work with. And I, I consider myself blessed to, to work with such a good crew, a good good team. How much are people paying you to say that? Well, somebody said is, something about ice cream later. <laughs> <laughs> who is paying you? <laughs> uh, and I also uh, rely very heavily on crop consultants. I would name a few, but then I'd run into the risk of leaving someone out. But crop consultants are eyes and ears on, on you know, thousands of acres that I can't touch just from a time and physical constraint standpoint. And then finally, uh, a lot of my work is heavily reliant on people that work for me during the summer. I've got a great crew this summer. We have four summer technicians. I've got two people full time and one graduate student working for me in watermelon. And it's a lot of work and they all pulled together. You know, we're, we are harvesting watermelons today. It's 94 degrees down there. Uh, it's, it's a great crew. Always need more people though. So if you guys know of anyone next year looking for a summer job, free produce, great sun tanning, you, you'll get plenty of exercise, but we also, you know, all of our work, I'd like to think helps make a difference. Oh, I, I definitely think what you all do makes a difference for sure. Absolutely. And what, you know, so what time of year should people be looking out for to apply to help you out there in the summer? So I try to because get my can pay cash too, besides all the fringe benefits of watermelon and produce and stuff like that. That's right. We do try to pay our folks a very good salary for the amount of work that we give them. It's uh, I try to build my crew by the end of March, early April, in part because we have a somewhat long paperwork process before they you know, from the time they say yes, the time they actually start can be pretty lengthy. So I'd say I'd, I'd like to get my crew inked in by the middle of April at the latest. Yeah, because you're already plotting and scheming of where you're putting traps and what you need to scout in January, February, right? Our, our field season kicks off right around the middle of March, and it doesn't let up until the very end of September, maybe early October. David, what is your favorite research project you're working on right now? My favorite research project, got a couple. Early in the season, we do a lot of slug work and some of that's been really fun. This year, we're, we're starting a new project looking at cover crops and slugs. We're harvesting a watermelon spider mite trial right now. And that's going to be a, a mainstay of the program. There's really not much information out there on, on how spider mites impact watermelons. That's my and question. I'm like, how, what, what's the whole deal with that? What's the tie-in? We know that they do impact the vine health, and it's, it's pretty obvious, but we don't know how they actually impact the, the weight and the fruit quality. Like average daily gain? Or, well, I guess for vegetables, don't do that, but for animals? Okay. Exactly. And then, so that's, those are to kind of an uh, early and mid season later in the season end of august early september we do a ton of sweet corn spray trials sweet corn is like i said earlier one of my favorite crops to work with and corn earworm is the pest of sweet corn sweet corn is one of the only crops where insects drive the spray program because we have to keep earworms out there's not a whole lot of other reasons you need to spray sweet corn except for corn earworm and then in the Raccoons. winter time, 
Uh, you know, you have to spray those though with a different type of, of product, a, a very high kinetic energy adjuvant chasing a metallic object. Uh, fortunately, we, we don't deal with raccoons at Carvel. We do deal with deer. And last year they tore up some sweet corn, which was kind of sad. And then in the wintertime, I've been dabbling with poultry pests. Here in Delaware, we, we have a little bit of everything. Pests? Our chicken industry is probably the biggest reason why we have so much agriculture here on the eastern shore, at least in field crops. In each of those chicken houses, there are certain insects that farmers spray for between mm-hmm. flocks, try to manage them, yep. and they can very quickly get out of hand on them. On birds? Uh, on the birds. Okay. Yep. One of those is called the darkling beetle. It's a dark wing. A darkling. Darkling. Yeah, it's a <laughs> little. I say you guys are naming things again. So let me guess. It turns their wings dark. It's a it's a black beetle, <laughs> and it's small. But that that's a big pest in poultry. Yeah, try try to keep uh, keep busy all year long. Awesome. You don't have to convince us. I think we all know David's a busy man, so we're happy to have him here with us today. You guys. Yeah, I have one more question because I know like you pull up the, the little woolly bugger things and the, depend on their stripe is <laughs> our, what, how bad our winter is going to be. So here's one. How about a wasp nest? I've heard the higher it is in the tree or whatever, the worse the winter is going to be because they want to keep away from the snow. Oh, interesting. I have not heard that. One. Oh, no. No. Because, okay. Because I was going to ask you, I found one like 14 foot. So can you tell me how much snow we're going to get this year? Uh, well, I'd be happy for a couple of inches. Yeah, we need some kind of cold because you were talking about winter conditions and affecting pest populations. Yes. We need cold winters to help alleviate some of that issue. We right? do, and we just have not had yeah, it last two break years. that cycle thing. You're... Yeah, it's, I was going to say, I can remember growing up and getting quite a bit of snow and just not seeing it the last couple of years. It's, you know, it's very apparent that things are changing for sure. Yeah, times, these times, they are changing. Cold winters are our friends. And this right. comes from a guy did sweet corn in Florida. <laughs> and they don't have cold winters. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. That's why it's your friend. <laughs> well, cool. Anybody else have any more questions? Uh, no, good to go. Dr. Owens, do you have a take-home message you'd like to send with us um, and, you know, put out there in the universe? Because I know, you know, in the Zoom, you're sitting in your spaceship. <laughs> and well, so, um, you know, I guess the, the take-home message would be that, you know, not every insect pest is, something that you need to control but if you're worried about it reach out to extension and we'll give you some guidance and insight on whether or not it is a pest and if it is what to do about it either this year or next so thank you appreciate it thank you We hope you've enjoyed today's episode and will join us next time. In the meantime, visit us online at udell.edu slash extension, join our mailing list, and join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at UD Extension. This program is brought to you by the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension, a service of the UD College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, a land-grant institution. This institution is an equal opportunity provider.